Okay, so I'm here with Matt Mueller. He is the creator and primary developer on a project called Bud. Now, my understanding of Bud is it is a website or application framework built on Golang um, that has dynamic front end. So you have Svelte support, uh, you've built some potentially some React support as well, or you're working on that. Um, and it's a full stack framework that can be used in a variety of different applications. Is that correct, Matt? Yeah, that's that's uh, correct. Um, it's yeah, the model here is uh, going after Laravel or Rails, um, so focused on both front end and back end. Yeah. Okay, and is the idea uh, that some of the advantages of building in Go is kind of like the single binary aspect of it, making deployment easier, or what, what's the primary, you know, thought process behind doing this again? Go's performance is is superior, or is it like the, the ease of development or the deployment process, or what kind of prompted you to think through like building this framework? Oh uh, yeah, um, it's been a long kind of long process, I would say. Um, I had built. Like I'm, I, I would say the majority of my professional career was doing like Node.js apps and, and things like that, and um, I started kind of going off on my own and like building um, through consulting and also just kind of building some some side projects and things. Um, and I was I kept running into like issues that I didn't feel like were um, my problem <laughs> essentially. Like I, I just felt like I was kind of like one one good example is like. I wanted to use the most like the RabbitMQ. I needed a queuing system, and I wanted to use the most popular one. Like I used the most popular RabbitMQ library in Node.js, and it didn't have logging and stuff. Like I kept mm -hmm. running into kind of those kinds of things over and over again. Then I, I kept thinking, do people actually run this stuff in production? Like it seems like it seems like I'm kind of on my own for a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so I um, this is a bit longer of a, of a story. No, than, please, uh, please, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, tell me. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, around that time I was like, I was having a lot of issues with, um, a app called standup Jack. It's like a Slack bot for standups. And, um, one of the kind of challenges of running a, um, a Slack bot is that if your Slack bot is like slow or like just doesn't respond to people, like people leave immediately <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. sure. And so it actually has like, like imagine you typing to a bot and then like, it just doesn't respond for five minutes. Like. That can be sometimes okay with a web app, um, but it's not okay with a bot. Like you know, your customers are gonna 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 leave pretty quickly if that happens once or twice. Yep. And so um, I was having issues with the the queuing service, like the message the message broker piece. Um, and at the time, I was talking with um, with uh, TJ, who was one of my like coworkers back in the day. Um, he was wrote this post like why I left Node.js for Go, basically. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was just kind of like, he was kind of seeing Go's praises at the, at the time. And so I wanted to give Go kind of a try and just see, like I had this message broker that was like pretty poorly made. Like it was, it was causing problems like once every 15 days or something I would have like kind of a, it would like the, the queue would pile up and stuff like that. And yeah. um, ended up writing it in Go and uh, like, it only took like a, I think a weekend to get like kind of the basic like the rewrite from just that piece from Node.js to to Go, Whoa. and then I like um, yeah like the RapidMQ library I, I don't know like it's kind of all of this is a bit of like circumstantial but like the RapidMQ library worked as as expected like I was having basically no more problems so I was kind of like oh wow like this this other ecosystem seems quite a bit farther along than the Node.js ecosystem and. Um, that kind of prompted me to kind of dig a little bit deeper in, in into um, into Go, and I ended up just starting like people say the syntax is kind of ugly and stuff like that, and but mm -hmm. I kind of like find it to be a bit of the opposite, where it's like it's simple and like it's it becomes kind of beautiful because it's so simple essentially. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I know another group of developers is like. Um, like I want, like I want to, I want to have like the expressiveness to craft my code in this beautiful way and stuff like that. Sure. And, I, and I get that, but um, I don't know. For me, I want to extract myself out from coding as like as soon as possible. If so I can give this to somebody else to do, like that sounds that sounds great to me. Yeah. Um, so I have no like for as far as coding, like I have no interest in kind of being like me and the code are one thing. Um, and so that, that's kind of like that's kind of maybe philosophically why I'm. Kind of drawn a little bit to go 
And then um, why I kind of built Bud was I just realized like I, I was kind of um, I was using Next.js for a while. That was that was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I kind of always had this like API and this this Next.js app basically, you know, running side by side with each other. Mm -hmm. And I kind of then was looking around at the Laravel, like some of the other communities, like I think my, one of my coworkers basically just pointed me to like something called LaraCast, which is like these Laravel videos basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I watched them and I was just like, wow, like the Node.js ecosystem is not even anywhere close to this. No ecosystem seems close to this. Sure. Um, yeah. And so I was just like, could this be done? Like, then I thought about Go and I was just like, Go is built specifically for web services. Like it, it's primer, like that was its purpose. Like Node.js was built for, I mean, no, like the V8 piece of Node.js was built for the browser. Like it wasn't purposely necessarily built for web services. Mm -hmm. They've kind of hacked Node around it basically. And I was just like, it seems like Go, like Go has all these great standard libraries for working with web, web services. Like, could you actually make go work like Laravel, I guess was my initial question. And that kind of set me on a bit of a journey. <laughs> so sorry for the longer answer to your simple no, question, but that, I thought the context would be helpful. That's totally helpful. I, I think it's weird because I, I know, uh, you know, you and I have projects in the similar space, but they're, I think they're solving, you know, different problems. But my, my experience getting into Go was very similar to yours. I, I had that same idea of like, Coding is just a means to accomplish a problem that I, I want to accomplish, right? And like some people really love expressive languages and they use it coding as almost a way of expressing their own creativity throughout the process of coding. And I didn't want that at all. I wanted something that was um, simple to understand and easy to read. And it's one of those programming languages that like I finally feel like I can read other people's code when I look at it. When I look at JavaScript, even though I've, you know, at this point I have a, a decent amount of experience in it, it's just, uh, I feel like I'm learning new concepts all the time. I, I feel like it's always like, wait, what is this syntactic piece that I have to look up and understand what's happening here? It's like, oh, that's just a shorthand, which is like another alternative to six different ways that you could have already have done it. Um, and, and Go is kind of like, it's like a brutalist architecture in certain ways, right? Like it's like you're, you're, um, you're checking errors all the time. It looks kind of gross. It look, like, you know, there's, there's no ternary operators or anything like that. It's just like very simple code, but I love it because, um, it makes it just like easier to onboard people. And you're often held up if you have a team, uh, if you're lucky enough to have a team, like, you know, you're only as good as your, your lowest common denominator or your most junior person. Right. So like having everybody work to that level is, is a much more robust framework for building things out than having everybody try to rise to the level of someone who has, you know, 25 years of experience in an industry. So I don't know. I, I love that aspect of go. And then I was like pleasantly surprised by all the other aspects of it, like, you know, compiling things down to a single binary that just works everywhere uh, is amazing. Um, the performance and the concurrency and all those different things that you just get along with that um, is awesome. So yeah, I totally understand why you would be interested in building out something and go and like taking the model from other projects that work re really well. So like things like Rails at work or uh, Laravel, obviously the lore casts are, are amazing. I think um, it's headed by a guy, Jeffrey Way, I believe, and yeah. he does an awesome job building those out. Um, it, it's just like, it's totally great. And then, um, looking at like the, the way that you'd build code, there's a lot of people in, in the Go ecosystem that I like, I feel like I understand their mentality when they're creating these things. So like Rob Pike obviously like has a lot of great quotes about like software development and how it makes sense to him. Um, there's another guy, Steve Francia, who, who like, you know, is on the Go team and he talks about like, you know, he can't really see the fingerprint of different people on his team when they're writing code. It all just looks like the same person's writing it. Like versus if you're writing JavaScript, you have, you know the style of a certain person, you can kind of tell who wrote it. So I don't know, I, I totally like am bought into the whole vision of why this is the right way to build services out. So that's great. Um, I know that you, in the past, you had built some other frameworks and projects out before. I believe you had a project called Joy at one point, is that correct? Yeah. Or is, so is Bud kind of like a iteration on Joy or is it completely new project and a completely new problem space? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, Joy, I would say, is to is quite a bit different. At, at that time, I was kind of, I mean, actually, I'm still kind of doing, I'm try I was trying to boil an ocean, basically, with uh, mm -hmm. with Joy. Like, um, I was bought into Go at this time already, and, like, I was just kind of, like, could, um, could you build a... Um, it, it gets back to kind of what you were saying. Like, like I don't want this, like, 
bo boutique code in my, like, I, I don't want to write it myself and I don't want other people to write it. Like I want this brutalist type of code that's kind of just like very simple to read because you're going to end up reading this code way more than you're going to end up like writing or, or updating it basically. And so um, Joy was, um, yeah, like an attempt to, um, yeah, compile, uh, compile Go to, to JavaScript, like some very simple JavaScript, like minimal JavaScript. This was kind of at the time with like Reason ML was around, like where they were they were compiling the Camel to like really nice, um, nice JavaScript. And I, w I wanted to see if I could contribute there. And um, yeah, it ended up being like I, I think I took like three months to work on that project. And it, um, yeah, it didn't end up. I, I realized like okay, this is going to be very hard to kind of build an ecosystem up around around this this thing and javascript isn't that bad basically was the conclu conclusion i kind of came to mm -hmm. um but i think what so to get back to your question like what how influential was it like it was um there they were tangential definitely in goals but the um the work i did enjoy like around compilers and just like understanding the syntax of like how go go you know the syntax trees work and how type checking works and all that stuff. All of that stuff carried into into Bud. Cool. And so I I think it's interesting in your answer. You said you know you came to the realization that JavaScript's not that bad. And I was looking at you know the Bud project and some of the things you have on you know your um, your roadmap there. And it looks like you know eliminating the need for having Node.js, which I you know I guess. Node.js and JavaScript are different things, but um, the, you know, I think one of the goal, stated goals of your project is to eliminate the need to have Node.js installed on your computer. And I, you know, that was one of the stated goals of my projects as well. I have my own opinions on it, but I'm curious how you came to that and, and the reasons why that's important to your project and, and the way that you're setting this up. Sure. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear your your reasons as well. Um, sure. my, my reasons were I want to deploy to Heroku or Fly.io, fly and if I if I've got a, if I have NPM, it's actually, somebody corrected me. I had a live stream the other day and somebody corrected me. It's like, it's actually not Node that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the um, Node tool chain. So sure. I got that wrong, but it, it's like having, requiring NPM to basically be installed um, is what I want to kind of remove. And basically the whole point of that is uh, to make it like kind of a standard Go application. So the build packs of Heroku, the build packs of Flat.io, um, understand, uh, like if I just get push up to Heroku, for example, it will understand that, that, that kind of go, go stack and it will just be able to build it without having to customize anything. And so it's mostly for deployment purposes. It does simplify the code a little bit, but, um, yeah, it's mo it's mostly for deploy purposes. Yeah. Yeah. I think I come from a similar mentality. So my. I'm a little hard on JavaScript sometime in general, like, but I, I think a lot of my hate is not node specific. It's mostly the ecosystem around it and just the complication of the ecosystem everywhere from, you know, uh, the way NPM works a lot of time uh, and like, you you know, you pull in a simple package and you're pulling in the universe of code, basically, you know, you have hundreds of packages to, you know, having to transpile things with Babel and wrap things up with Webpack. And uh, it's just, I think there should be, I feel like simpler approaches, especially as the browsers get better with things like ESM. And I, you know, I think Dino is kind of like an answer to this, right? So Dino is, is like, okay, we're going to take the things that we did wrong in Node and we're going to improve them for this ecosystem. But I also think that we could go a step further and we could use tools like Go that have a lot of benefits as well. And you could potentially still write the wrongs of those things. So like, for instance, um, my, my project Plenty, um, and, you know, obviously I'm kicking things around and like, they're all shaky in the beginning, but I'm figuring them out. But like one of the things I did early on is I decided I didn't want to bundle things. So, you know, it doesn't use roll up or webpack or anything like that. So we're, we're hitting the Svelte compiler directly. And then we build those into like separate packages that are just like ESM imported in the browser. And, um, I also, I was even at the point where, um, there's a popular, popular project called Snowpack, which people use pretty often to be like an unbundler essentially. Um, I, I created my own little tool that's not as good as their tool, but it's a lot faster um, to, to basically do that. So basically, if your project's using these NPM things, which essentially you still need to have on your, your local computer if you're going to install them and manage them, but then we can pull them into the project during the build step. So you don't necessarily need to have that JavaScript um, overhead to, to have that process work. Um, and I think I saw some of your stuff you posted. I wasn't really that familiar with this term, but uh, import maps, you talk a lot about that. And I, I noticed that you linked to a... a, a video by dhh um uh, about uh like what that is and how that works so i took a look at that and i mean essentially it seems like it's all 
based on this idea of importing things versus um, kind of bundling it up that way. Um, so yeah, that's interesting that you're coming from the same place there. Um, yeah, it's cool that you mentioned Snowpack. Um, that was a, I actually can't remember at this point, but it was, I think it was either Snowpack or Vite. They kind of do this thing where they rewrite the, um, the node modules or they serve node modules separately or like, oh no, what happens is you do a node module slash spelt, for example, and then it will bundle that on that, just that piece on demand. So mm -hmm. you don't have, you don't, you're not importing like a hundred different things. Like the, I guess the problem is like with underscore, like you import underscore and it, it goes off and imports like a hundred different packages, but yeah. they're kind of smart enough to, from like, I guess, node modules of the boundary basically. And then you import from a node module and then it kind of bundles that and serves that. Mm -hmm. um, did your project also do something like that? My project was, so um, it's, I would like to some at some point maybe release it as a separate like uh, package, but right now it's just kind of baked into uh, the Plenty project itself because it's a lot of things have kind of grown organically over time and gotten a little messy to be honest. Uh, but like the GoPack project is pretty simple. What it does is it, it well, it used to be worse, but it's getting better. So what it does now is if your code is referencing, if it's trying to import something and you're writing it in such a way that you're not importing it locally. So for instance, like one Svelte file can call another Svelte file and you know, my project knows to grab those and put them together. But if you're importing something that looks like it can't be resolved in that local kind of pathway, then it knows to look to NPM. And what GoPack does is it goes to NPM and it reads the package.json file, which will then tell you a, do you have ESM support? Because some things are not ESM ready, which means you know they can't run in the browser. They're, they can run in Node and they require Node packages locally. Um, so is there ESM support? If there is, then we'll, where is that entry point for that ESM module? And then I'll go and I'll grab that, copy it over to the project, and then we'll rewrite the paths in um, the, the files that reference it to make sure that they're actually resolvable by those things. Because oftentimes, you know, you're referencing a Svelte file and that turns to a JS file when it's compiled, or you know, these things are, are kind of like mixed up. And so we, we'll fix those and we kind of bundle them together. So essentially what you end up with in the browser is you, there's this folder called uh, web modules, which I took the naming convention from Snowpack. So they create a folder called web modules and then you just splice all those projects in there and then you can reference them through ESM imports. So that's that's what we're doing um, now. Uh, I'm sure there are edge cases and, and bugs and things that it could get better, but I would love to maybe at some point release as a tool so other folks who are interested in this can help me improve it versus it kind of living on the island in, in the plenty world. And you know, that's always a, a recipe for disaster if you have too many self built tools, <laughs> which I tend oh, to do. Yeah. 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 That's, that's awesome. Um, is, is there, so one thing that the imports map thing that Rails does is they go to actually a CDN that's kind of specially made. It kind of does that re resolution step for, for you. Did you consider also doing, um, going to one of those, like I think ESM.sh or something? Yeah. So there's, um, Okay, so and this is where I might be a little foggy, but there's a, a project that might be related to Snowpack or, or is essentially the same technology called Skypack. And is that kind of like doing that? Is that the idea? It's like it's pulling those from remote URLs. There, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of people I've talked to like in the similar space to us that are building really interesting projects and they're they're basing their whole ecosystem around that. So they're saying like, hey, you don't even need NPM locally. We're going to resolve this in the browser and we're going to go pull it from a CDN. So yes, that is definitely something... I'd be interested in. I know there's a couple of people in my issue queue talking about it, but I haven't, I haven't put a great deal of effort into because we're we're trying to do a bunch of other things that we're just behind on. But um, yeah, I would love to to look at that. Is that something that you're thinking about or focusing on yet, or is that? Um, well, when, once we get to doing kind of removing npm from the from the equation, I think I'll that'll be like how will we do it basically. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I also like it's been I think a year since I've actually wrote, wrote the code that does kind of like the resolution stuff and so I'm I, I'm also like super foggy on even what Bud does right now. Oh, yeah. I just remember basically taking it from so ESM.sh has a is like um, is an open source Go um, CDN basically, oh, cool. and they have some pretty some interesting stuff in there that um, like rewrites imports and things like that that. Um, I brought in to bot actually. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's been a little bit. <laughs> yeah. That's so I didn't know about ESM.sh. So I'm going to check that out because it's yeah. probably people who have written what I've done, but better. So oftentimes I only write tools because I can't Google well enough to find the tool that already exists. So that's good to know about. Yeah. Um, well, I also think we, we may end up like 
we should talk about this more and kind of refresh our memories on what we actually did with like <laughs> go back and like and what I've got bundled it because like I have a feeling our solution would be the same. So like we might want to collaborate on that that piece. Um, yeah, I I think that we I, we probably have a lot of pieces we can collaborate on, which would yeah. be great because I'm having the same problem now. Like I've been working on plenty for a few years now, and I'm oftentimes I'm going in the code base and I'm rediscovering things that I've written or worked on, and it's just it's almost like the concept is like, okay, this is working well enough that I haven't touched it, but I have to really rediscover what the thinking process was there. So um, if we can consolidate things, I think that's always the way forward. And, and speaking to that, I think one of the biggest things would be kind of talking about Svelte and compiling. That for me is probably one of the weaker points of my project and, and thing that I really need to rework at some point to make it really the project that I want it to be. And I know it's something that you've been interested in because that's actually for folks who don't know the context, that's how we connect in the first place. Um, there's this project called Goja, which is basically a JavaScript interpreter written in Go, pure Go. Um, and you had posted a question on there about class support because class support is needed to run the Svelte compiler. Um, I found I found the same issue because I was testing around and yeah. uh, turns out that we're trying to solve similar problems in that way. So I, I don't know. I, I have a lot of questions I want to just ask you about Bud and how it's structured. And I think that kind of segues into the compiler questions and maybe strategies we can use to go forward. Um, is it okay if I just blast some questions at you about like fundamentals of how Bud works? Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, I just I want to kind of add to that. Like, I've been seeing your your avatar around, like, on all the similar issues, and so I'm like, I, I think you reached out to me after that, and I was like, oh, I'm super glad you did because I just felt like we're like in the same space, yeah. but we don't know each other. So I was kind of like, okay, that, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. That that issue wasn't the first time I had seen you. That was just like the straw <laughs> that broke the camel's back. I was like, all right, yeah, it's you, like, what's this guy doing? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that that's funny, and it's also like for me, it's super exciting because. I feel like, you know, half the time I'm floating in this space where they're like, nobody's doing the thing around me. I'm like, oh, is this even making sense? And then to see somebody yeah. trying to solve the same problems is super exciting to me. Um, and I think it's, it gives us a shot of actually accomplishing them. If we have a couple of people who are like-minded who want to do this, um, I'm yeah. worried if it's just one or two of us that it's, it's much more difficult. Yeah. Well, we could all be crazy. Who knows? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to rule that out. Um, <laughs> Okay. Did you see, so, uh, there's uh, one more thing. Uh, did you see there's an, another pr uh, full stack framework that came out for Go called Copper? Copper no. Go? Okay. No. That, that one came out, I think, two or three days ago. I got mentioned a couple times in relation to that. Um, so that there may be somebody else we can kind of collaborate with on, on this stuff. Great. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that sounds awesome. Actually, before I get into my blast questions, so do, do you kind of see, like, I know you get inspiration from Laravel and these other projects. Is does Bud fundamentally work kind of like Next.js, where you can think of your apps in terms of like a Jamstack architecture or a full like stack SSR architecture? And if any of those if those were words that you're not using in your nomenclature, let me know and I can clarify what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, I, I do happen to know. Uh, <laughs> it, um, but if you ask me so many too many other JavaScript questions, I would be like a little like a snapshot testing and all that stuff. I've got I've gotten a, a little bit old and out of date on some of this stuff. Um, it, it doesn't take long in JavaScript. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, that's actually one of the reasons. Like, so I don't write like I, I, I work at a company called Prisma, and like I don't actually write that much. Um, like we're primarily a TypeScript shop, but I, and I know TypeScript, but I don't actually write that much anymore. And it's not because I like I can't contribute. It's because the libraries and ecosystem has moved so quickly that all the things I bring in, like all the NPM modules I bring in are from like five years ago and nobody knows how to use them anymore, but that's like where my headspace is. So like, oh, we need like testing framework. Okay, I'm gonna use, bring in Mocha or like, uh -huh. oh, we need an API server. Okay, I'm gonna bring in Express or Koa, but like, it's like, no, these aren't the ones we use anymore. anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's and all these other things. And so it's uh -huh. like, it's super confusing and like, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, anyway. Yeah. Small side note. Your question. Um, it was about SSR and uh, where do where does so, Bud kind of fit into that? So yeah, like so next. So I guess Next.js has this model where you can kind of split um, different parts of the app where you, you want to just statically generate a certain part and then other mm -hmm. parts you need server rendered and you can kind of do both of those. Is, is that part of Bud's philosophy or not really? Um, no. Uh, so. I went pretty far down the um, kind of pre-rendering path um, mm -hmm. where you 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 pre-render. Actually, I got this other project called Elmo, um, which was a preact and um, kind of pre-rendered thing. It was like an eight, I think. Let me see if I can actually pull it up. Um, 
Yeah, I think. Oh no, it's private now. I'll I'll send you a link after uh, after this, and you okay. can kind of post it. But um, so I went really far down the the pre rendering path where I was like, I I built basically Next.js, but like it was eight kilobytes big, and it was in TypeScript, and it was um, yeah, it was pre it was fully pre rendered, mm -hmm. um, so just HTML and um, JavaScript on the client side. Um, I kind of realized, so there's um, there's this tweet by the, one of the Remix guys actually, um, before I think even Remix was a thing, but it was like, um, it was something along the lines of like the CDNs, um, CDNs have gotten so good that like, you, like pre-rendering is kind of an optimization on some, on like it's, it's a small use case, it's a small optimization basically. And so mm. I kind of, took that a little, like I looked into the, what he was talking about first a little bit more and I kind of realized, I kind of came to the same conclusion. Like you could you could put a Bud app um, behind a cloud Cloudflare really quite easily and like, and then have Cloudflare be your kind of pre-rendered step essentially. Yep. And so I kind of got, I kind of got out of that Jamstack space a bit because of that, like that reason I kind of moved away from that. So what Bud is now is um, it's a server rendered, um, SSR style app, you, you make a request to, I don't know, some page and like that page is, it's like next in that each page is kind of its own route essentially. And like um, it, it, then it sends on the HTML and then with that HTML, it also has the JavaScript to uh, hydrate itself basically. Interesting. That, okay, so this, this, I have a bunch of questions on this. So, um, so for, actually before I do that, it's funny. So it's like you were, Think about this problem space and you like came to this fork in the road like what to do with like pre-rendering and that stuff i took the other side of the fork so i don't know how much you know about plenty but plenty is basically a jamstack only application which obviously you know it limits certain things you can do without other services right like it vastly limits that but the idea um behind my project was to simplify simple websites so um uh like deploying building and deploying simple websites and then being able to edit those websites without having to set up other infrastructure like um, headless CMSs and stuff like that. So we have this get back CMS that's actually baked into the thing. I don't want to go too deep down into that because I have a lot of questions about your project, but I just, just so that's out there, like it's yeah. interesting how we kind of came to the, the fork and we took different paths there. Um, yeah, no, it, it's, it's um, so yeah, I think you're like, you're right that it, it's um, pre-rendering is way easier. Like you just throw it up on S, S3 and like you put Cloudflare uh, cloud front in front of it. And, like, it's just like, there's no moving parts. Like you, uh, this thing can scale to infinity and you have nothing, nothing um, to move. I'm, I want, um, I wanted, but to be more general purpose essentially where like it was, it could work kind of like, it, it's not as optimized for like these, these um, like having a blog or like having a CMS system or something sure. like that. It's more optimized for, I don't know, just kind of like the things that Rails was like, you can build with Rails, like, I don't know, yeah. eventually maybe a GitHub or like a Twitter or something like that. Yeah, I there's like definitely a Venn diagram of like competencies, right? So this idea, like, so there are some people who try to make, you know, like a, like a CMS, for instance, do everything that like a static site generator could do. And other, but there's like this Venn diagram of like, Jamstack is really good at certain things, but it's not going to do things that Bud does really well, really easily. You could probably force it and you could probably string together a bunch of microservices, but it's going to be really challenging, yeah. right? So, um, and then at the, the same token, like there's probably going to be some complexity that's involved maybe with a full stack application that you that you wouldn't have with a, a Jamstack application. Um, so it is interesting that how those things kind of cross over. Um, yeah. Well, I can give I think, you an, another example really yeah. quick. Like I can't deploy to Netlify right now, but Netlify is my preferred provider. Like that yeah. would be really great if I could deploy but to Netlify. But um and I and my standupjack.com, that's a Netlify website. Like I've deployed to Netlify, it's really quick, it's amazing, like it's yeah. a static website and I love it, like it's awesome. But um but yeah, I'm I'm wanting to have kind of a fuller uh, like a more general purpose uh server yeah and um obviously it's the the community is responding to it so that, that i think you're hitting the nail on the head for sure um the interesting thing about I, I feel like i'm going on so many tangents here but netlify so the way their build process works is they have this like giant build container that has dependencies for popular projects so like hugo is built into it but my mm -hmm. like a project like mine plenty without having like a, a huge community behind it to to get it involved in that you actually have to do your builds outside of netlify and then deploy oh. them which is fine because we we do dedicated build containers for every release that we do just so people can like either lock it out like a working release or whatever they want to do um but i just found that like really interesting because i always thought that 
I thought Netlify at its core was a CI with a CDN. And then they have a lot of bells and whistles on top of like redirects mm -hmm. and forms and whatever. But I thought that was the core. But really, I don't think the core is CI. I think CI is just like something that they happen to do to, to build the popular site generators. But I don't know. I just found that really interesting. interesting. Yeah. I, it's going on that tangent a little farther. Um, so, do you, um, if if you if you're not working with a team, so I think you if you need if you're working with a team, you probably need it to be like Git push, and then like it put it it triggers Netlify CI or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you don't need that, which is something I don't need with StandUpJack, I literally just build into a build dot build directory, and then there's a Netlify C, CI uh, CLI that actually can just pu publish directly. Uh -huh, um, yeah. That might be worth. I don't know if like if if it's if it's if you're doing a solo like I I do for Standup Jack like it's it's actually I don't even have I don't even think I have a CI set up like it's literally just when you need to deploy I just deploy off my laptop and it's like it's pretty pretty nice. Yeah, and I think that like behind the scenes that's how something like GitHub Pages actually works. So like they create like mm -hmm. a a gh hyphen pages branch which is essentially just your build directory <laughs> and it, like you could there's there's um, GitHub Actions that will like basically compile and then write that that for you. So like, yeah, I think that that's definitely a way that you can accomplish some of that stuff. Um, let me let me dive into a couple of my questions about just like some of the fundamentals of Bud. Uh, so, and I know we're actually already over the time that we allocated here, so I don't wanna- Oh no, that's that's all good. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm <laughs> turning a light on now. Yeah. You're good. Um, if you can still hear me, I'll just keep, I'll fire them off. Yeah, keep talking, yeah, sorry. So like, so, um, Bud, uh, you know, has felt kind of as like a first uh, class uh, language for building out front, like reactive front ends, right? So um, how are you like getting data from Bud to your front end there? Are you basically generating JSON that the front end's consuming or like what is that interaction between your Go project and the actual front end that's rendering things out? Um... It's a, uh, I wonder if I can actually share, can I share my screen? Yeah, there's at the bottom. Would that be helpful? A little, yeah, it's okay, like a little. Let me try it. Yeah. I'm just wondering if, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see myself. Oh, you can see, oh yeah, of course, that makes sense. Um, I, can, I can just kind of walk through it. I think that would be a little bit easier than, than trying to explain. Um, oops. Oh, okay, hopefully that's no problem. Um, so, okay, the views, um, all right, loader, oh, it's actually in this view server. Okay, so we've got this um, this render function. Maybe I'll go from a high level. Um, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you've got this view, this view, Oh no, you might have frozen on me. I'm sorry, my computer is like completely every time I do something it yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually just stop sharing. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. can I get back to I'll just explain it. It's sorry, okay. my computer yeah. is not happy with uh <laughs> Yeah, for some reason you're cutting out there. Anyway, but, yeah. yeah. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah. I gotta get a new computer, I guess. Um <laughs> So okay, so the con the controller like the, some inside the generated code, there's a um, view dot render function, and then mm -hmm. view dot render function takes basically the prop the va the values you returned from your controller and and kind of puts them in in there as as parameters, and then um, within that, so Bud itself um, has a uh, Svelte compiler. Um, embedded inside it, so like it, and it works. I, I think I've stopped using I think ESM out. Uh, sorry, I've stopped the things that were specific, that were specific to either Node.js or I think the browser. I've stubbed those out using ESM. So it's a build that works if you just load it into V8. Like if you just had a um, V8 interpreter and you just said run this code, it mm -hmm. will run that code and it will spit out a Svelte compiler. And so you can then use that Svelte compiler inside the view server. And I can just, so what happens is um, I basically say, okay, compile 
um, it's actually all in one bundle, but like I, I say, okay, compile, compile this stealth code using this stealth compiler. And then that compiles it to JavaScript. And then I use V8 again, or maybe at the same time, I can't remember to render, at, render that JavaScript. And I pass those props through as like unmarshaled or, or marshaled uh, um, JSON. So then it, what comes out is HTML basically. And then I serve that HTML. Oh, interesting. Okay. So this is getting through a ton of stuff that I'm curious about. Um, I'm going to jump ahead just to some other questions here, just because you've prompted me. Uh, so, okay, we, you're getting the compiler from Salt, obviously. Are you are you pulling that like from npm and then on the fly generating that kind of slim down compiler, or do you have that slim down compiler like embedded in your Go um, code somewhere? Or how does that work? Let me let me see if I can find it. And uh, Salt. I know you can't see my screen. I'm trying to I'm trying to remind myself actually, because again, a lot of this stuff, like if you're working on a project by yourself, you really and like it goes on for more than like a month or so, you kind of forget what's going on after like especially the code bases that just kind of work. Um, um okay, so where is it? So um, okay, I can't find it, but I'll just I'll I'll, I'll try to describe it from memory. Yeah. Um, so, Bud has a package at JSON that just you can just npm install Svelte, and it's got a certain version of Svelte that I that's in Node modules in the in the development version of Bud. And so I've got the compiler sitting there in Node modules. Mm -hmm. And so what ESM does, or sorry, ES build does is it just kind of I, I think I use a go generate command basically, and I just have like this long yes build um, command, and it just it it just reaches in as an input to this where the Svelte compiler is, and an output it just outputs to some Svelte compiler.js file in my mm. in my code okay. code base. And then I think that I get ignore that I can't remember exactly, but then yeah. then I go in, I use go embeds that go embed parameter on that mm -hmm. file and so then it's it's sitting in the binary itself yep. so the compiler is sitting in the binary itself yeah. okay interesting that's really cool um so so uh es build is essentially taking that compiler and making something that v8 go can run really because you're using v8 go right okay yeah so it's making because so what i'm doing right now and again i think um Svelte now ships, and maybe they always did. They ship with uh, two compilers. One is like the ESM ready version and the other one's like the node version. For some reason I had started with the node version. Maybe it's because it was before I understood the differences between these things. And, I, and I'm and i I'm pulling that into um, a V8 Go VM. Uh, and I'm having to pre-process it because obviously things like require statements and this and that can't be processed. So I'm pro pre-processing those things out um, and making it work for the project. And then I'm loading that in and then I'm doing like, compiling inside of V8 Go at that point. Um, the, the problem with that is I have to constantly worry about, okay, a new version of Svelte comes out. It's like, now what do I have to pre-process here now to make it work continually? I'm going to have to think about that stuff. It sounds like you have a more sustainable way to say, okay, a new version of Svelte comes out. ES build will turn this into something that I can run in my compiler. Is that is it that uh, sustainable or is it more hands-on? Yeah, I think it is for the most part. I think you're, you're probably like, can I paste in commands into this thing? Um, Possibly, there's a little check right at the bottom. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, oh, I found the chat. Uh, okay. Oh, well, this mm -hmm. is going to be a nightmare. Um, <laughs> oh man. Okay. Wow. Never mind. Um, so, okay. What did I do exactly? Um, but you're you're basically every time you're starting up. Is it like when you start up your project, you're essentially doing that process uh, that that go generate is essentially like grabbing that and making the compiler no ready? it's just no. whenever i like i think when i release i just run like mm. as part of the make file i just run go generate and it will kind of pull that in um there's some way okay so, so there there's some way in with the the es build configuration sure. to kind of yeah, yeah like um not have to not have to mess too much with it um yeah. I also have a bit of a wrapper around it too, to kind of, um, so I was wrong that I don't just like completely compile. Well, I do compile the Svelte compiler, but I don't compile it like 
raw. Like what I do is I've got this compiler.ts file that I actually that imports the Svelte compiler itself and just kind of wraps it in something that makes it I, I think easier to kind of you you send something in and you get something out and it's specific to Bud. So that mm. may also help to you kind of like instead of importing directly that Svelte compiler or, or bundling that Svelte compiler, you actually have kind of an entry point that imports the Svelte compiler and then you like you use that as kind of the, your interface basically. Um, I'll send you after this, I'll send you like where this is in the code so you can kind of dive in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have to poke around. I, I started yeah. at one point and then, you know, there's obviously a lot there. So this is great to yeah. get your... Um... Yeah, I think um, I, so I, I also looked, I think I looked at to see what Plenty was doing. And um, if I remember, yeah, I, I don't remember you embedding Svelte. I think that was the... Well... <laughs> So we do for what only one reason. So essentially we don't want you to have to have node or anything installed on your computer. So we, we embed the three packages that are needed to run a, a planning site. So basically when you create your scaffolding, it creates those, the node modules folder and it creates spell. Um, and stuff. That, oh. That's not necessary um, uh, because uh, you could just use NPM, but in case you didn't have node on your computer, we want to allow that fallback. So we do uh, use the embed file system just for that. But then essentially what we do is on every build, we're, we're pulling, you know, we're starting up that uh, VM and we're, we're pulling in the compiler and we're, we're running that, that process. Um, so uh, yeah, th that whole thing is happening for us every time. And then- uh, um, I, I, Actually, I think that's also happening here too. Cause I think on boot it, it will load, like you just bring in the spell compiler, you just load up the isolate and then you're kind of, it's, it is reused across re requests though. But for your build time, I don't know if there's any better way of doing that. Yeah, but my whole like the the concept with the with plenty was that everything is atomic. So like every build, even though if you're developing locally, you might be just changing one letter and rebuilding every time, which is really inefficient. But the whole idea is that this should be able to be deployed, and then the whole process should always happen in CI, so you can like edit on the in the browser, and it kicks off CI and rebuilds and does it. So like uh, okay. the whole idea was to make the build atomic. So for us, it happens every time, even though we know that it's not the most efficient way to do it. Um, but is it still pretty fast? I mean, that I, I think like loading an isolate and loading Svelte in there is not that slow, is it? Yeah, on my computer, it's okay. Again, I have to keep in mind that not everybody has the same computer that I have, right? Um, my computer's seven years old at this point. It's not, it's not a new computer, but it, it's, you know, it's got enough RAM and to, to run these things. So I have to, I want to make it a little more efficient for people who have less computer um, resources. So uh, eventually it should get better. But I think the the real bottleneck is that, you know, we compile every um, every component, but then we also do an SSR compilation of every component. And then for every content source, when we create a route, uh, we do the render process. So um, uh, when you have an SSR Svelte component, you can do a, a dot render method on that to actually create HTML fallbacks. And that's how we create our HTML through that process. Are you doing the same thing? Or are you generating your HTML through like Go templates or something else? Uh, yeah, it's this exact same same thing. Um, I'm I'm jealous that you get to do it at build time. I have to do it at uh, per, per request basically. Yeah, yeah. How, that's so. So how do you make that process fast? Is it? I'm sure it's really challenging. Um. So I can't speak to other other people's computers, but I do. I, I think in, like it's. I feel like it's fast enough. The thing that is really slow right now that is bothering me a lot is go build. <laughs> like go build is very slow. And so when uh, you don't have, you actually don't have a back end. So you're you're in good shape, yeah. but Bud has a back end. So every, like the, there's library load on the front end and then there's library load also on the back end. Mm -hmm. And every time you make a change to a controller, um, I've been seeing 10 seconds of recompiling and I'm like, oh Jesus, I, I don't want to go to sleep after, after mm, seeing this. Yeah. But um, so I need to like, I'm, I'm quite worried actually about go, like for some reason go run or go build doesn't seem fast enough. Um, hmm. I don't know. It, it, it seems like more of a problem when you're, you've got live reload enabled than if you were doing it before when you just like do write a bunch of code and then you run go run, like it seems, it seemed more acceptable for some reason, but now that I have it kind of in a loop that you make a change and you're watching, you're waiting and waiting and waiting for it to actually go run. Like, yeah. I don't know, I'm kind of, that's one one of my worries right now at Bud. Are you using FS Notify or something like that to watch for file changes to, to rebuild? Yeah. I yeah. wonder, I feel like, so 
uh, Plenty compiles, again, obviously it doesn't have the backend complexity like you're saying, but when I'm actually writing for the engine, I'm Go building, it's, it's generally pretty fast. And my understanding is that, you know, it's one of the huge advantages to Go. So I wonder if there's something that maybe you could identify as a bottleneck there to speed that process up. Cause that seems like it should be faster. Yeah, I'm doing some slow things. Um, there, I need to write a like a proper issue about this, but um, there's Go build seems to be faster if you are overwriting the previous binary. Mm -hmm. So if you're like if you go build out to main and then you do that again, it the second time is a lot faster, even if you've made changes to the code. And so I think they're they're saving some time somewhere on that. Bud currently doesn't do that. So Bud will build to a new, it uses kind of its hashing thing where like if you didn't make any changes or if you have a, if you've made changes that are matches a previous version, it's like it's in like 25 milliseconds. But if oh, yeah. you make even just a minor change, like a, a character change, then it's like 10 seconds. And it's like, oh God, this is terrible if you're actually iterating on a project, like, cause you're never going to go back to your previous state. Sure. So I need to like, rewrite or revamp that whole whole thing to and i think the solution is it has to write on top of itself and then it's quite a bit faster but um but even then it's still like three seconds and i'm just like oh man like yeah. this come if you compare it to like remix it's like a, a gold standard right now with like server side rendering and um client side like they're instant and and they're they're also lucky because they get um like they get to use esm or sorry i keep saying esm <laughs> es build Mm -hmm. ES build is almost instant for them. And then they're, they've already got Node.js running. So like they just like re require and they import this thing. And, and one of the things that I've been really missing about JavaScript or just like annoyed with Go about is, is no, like the plugin support is awful right now. So you can't, you couldn't re really rebuild a, a Go plugin basically and import that. And so I'm trying to figure out hacks to like make that a little bit nicer, but it's like, it's pretty bad. Oh yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've always thought about that too, like how, how that would be accomplished. Um, I think you, you're not alone, at least with like, uh, you know, if you're if you're not making changes, Go always compiles like extremely fast. It no, it's it's aware of that. It's only when you start making changes does it have to start like slowing down that whole process. Mm -hmm. um, so I've definitely experienced that as well. Um, so you mentioned at one point you were talking about like your make file and kind of like releases. Do you use Go releaser? I was looking at the project. I didn't see a, a releaser file. Oh no, I wanted to, um, but I have, I wasn't able to figure out V8. Actually you, I was looking at your project and you were able to figure it out, but I wasn't able to figure out what you figured out basically. What is, so the challenge being cross compiling, is that the issue? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So uh, it, like what support do you have right now? So I do Linux and Darwin uh, Mac support. Um, I would love to do Windows and other stuff, but I just V8 doesn't yep. support it right now. Um, are you just doing Mac and in, in Linux at this point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so there is a way to do it. Um, you can use <laughs> it. I have a project. It's it's gross, um, but there's this project called OSX Cross, which you may have come across at one point. That is what I'm using. Okay, so okay. maybe we did end up. Maybe I did end up like looking at what you did and been like, oh, okay. So, but I, yeah, that worked. Okay, so but you have to do that locally, right? Yeah. So I so okay so basically the, that project is super specific about like absolute paths on your computer. But you can fake, so I have a Linux computer and we're running the CI on a Linux computer. So you can kind of fake that process in your, your build and your release cycle. So I made this other project. It's in, so if you go to uh, github.com forward slash Plentico, that's where my project lives at. There's a project in there called OSX cross target or something like that. Mm. And essentially what you can do is you can put a step in your CI if you're using GitHub actions or whatever, and you can just basically pull that in and it'll, it'll do a Mac build for you. Oh, that's cool. Okay, so hopefully, yeah. hopefully that works for you. I think there's a couple other people potentially using it. I never intended that to be like a serious project. It's like, it's this really gross, <laughs> hard-coded thing that I just put together, but it, it's it been working for me. So maybe it'll work for you. I don't know. Check it out. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll have to check that out. Um, yeah. That, that It solves a big problem. Like I was, I don't know if about you, but like when I was actually trying to release, but it took me like a week to figure that piece out. I was like, this oh. shouldn't be that hard. <laughs> oh, it's so hard. And that's, I mean, that's part of the reason why I'm this aggressive about thinking about other alternatives mm -hmm. to V8 Go. I, I think V8 Go is, is amazing, right? Am I, is that the project V8 Go? Yeah. Um, yeah it's really, yeah. really great. But the, the C Go dependency is really just like making things super hard. So, I, I mean, the OSX cross target shouldn't be needed, right? We should, because Go is really good at compiling for all sorts of variety of devices. So I would love to see my project and yours as well get to the point where we can just 
build targets for everybody. Maybe that's Goja, maybe that's something else. But um, uh, yeah, check that out in the meantime because Go Releaser is super amazing if you haven't used it before. It makes I've like, used it before. Awesome. It's it's my definitely my default. Yeah, it's yeah. it's great. Yeah. Um, cool. All right, we're I, we're like right at the end of time here. I, I don't know. Do you have time for another question or or, or two, and then call? Yeah, it? I'm right. having fun. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, so, um, I guess uh, in terms of uh, uh, ways we can approach like compiling Svelte and Go, and we've talked about this, you know, via Go, we both settled on that for now. Um, I, I know we had talked about looking into like, you know, if you had a node dependency, you could do like an exec command on that. I've tried that in the past. I think you have as well. Um, you had mentioned one to me that I don't know enough about, and I would love for you to do the explain it like I'm five to me for quick JS and porting that and how that works. And the pro, because I think at one point you were talking about doing quick JS porting. Oh, yeah. Is that something yeah, that yeah. you've pursued? Is it something that I don't really understand how quick JS works or, or what it is or what the benefit there is? So if it, is this something you sure. can explain? Yeah, yeah. Um... So QuickJS is an alternative to V8. Like it does basically the exact same thing. It's a um, it's a JavaScript interpreter. It's written in C. The unique thing about QuickJS is, well, I guess there's two things. Um, one that it's written in C and not C++. Um, so, and two, it's a single, it's essentially a single C file that's like 50,000 lines of code. Mm. Um, and it does basically everything. I mean, it's, it's got ES twenty twenty support. Like it's it's fully stocked up with the latest, the greatest of, of JavaScript. Um, and what got me interested in it um, was that it's tiny. I, also, Figma uses it. Their mm -hmm. plugin system. If you build um, plugins, they use Quick JS under the hood. Is what I've heard. Um, so it's tiny. So it's a manageable kind of dependency. Like I, so we, we share the same pain of Seago and V8 and just like the complexities that like, there's so many things, decisions I've had to make about the project based on the, just having that dependency in there. Same, basically. same. Yeah. Um, and so I love that. Like, I don't think I could have gotten SSR working without V8 Go. So I'm super same. grateful to this, of course, <laughs> but um, I really, I mean, it's a heavy, it's a heavy burden to, to carry in a project. Um, and so obviously looking for as any different kinds of alternatives as possible and QuickJS kind of popped up as like, this thing is manageable. It's a manageable dependency. Um, so the first thing I tried with QuickJS was to basically use Seago, like kind of have it like do the same thing that V8 Go does, then do it with QuickJS. Unfortunately, I just don't know enough about this stuff to like make those bindings. And so I've tried a couple libraries and they weren't nearly as like robust as V8, V8 Go was. Um, so I stuck with V8 Go for now. Um, but what I really want to do is, so there, um, the, the Go compiler originally was written in C and, um, like it was like it was also around fifty thousand lines of C code or something like that. And what happened was they wrote a program to to basically compile that C code or transpile that C code to Go. Mm -hmm. And then it wasn't like a you run this command and it just works. It was like a very man like a manual, but like helped you quite a bit through the process basically. Yep. And so, um, but they were able to kind of incrementally port this thing to Go and then clean up kind of that transpiled code, and then now you have a Go compiler. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if you could do the same thing for QuickJS. Um, mm. And if, um, so there's a couple different paths. There's the Goja path, which is moving moving forward, but slowly. Mm -hmm. um, then there's this path, which uh, I think would be interesting if, I'm hopeful somebody kind of takes it under, like onto their wing and just gives it a go. I, I don't have um, the time or resources to do it right now. So I'm kind of just like, if that changes, I will I will take that on. Like I'm, ex I'd be excited to take that on. But um, I, yeah, right now I'm kind of um, waiting for hopefully some miracle. It's kind of like the miracle of ES build. Like, like when ES build came out, I was like, oh, this is a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm hoping for something like that with QuickJS. Oh my god, yeah. yeah. I feel like you approach things the same way I do. Like yeah. there's all these different. I put my feelers out in a bunch of different ways, and I looked at them. I'm trying to to weigh the amount of work because I realistically, you know, you only have so many resources, so many time, so much time in the day. And every second that you're not spending building bud, like you're, you're diluting it. Right. So like you could be building a, a quick JS 
solution, which is great and would help a lot of projects, but like now Bud is getting neglected. So like balancing that is super hard. And I've, I've had the same challenges. Cause I mean, I, I've kind of come to the conclusion that like, I, I absolutely adore Svelte and I think it's the right way to go. And I think it's the way to, to describe interactive UIs. And I think that it, they, they totally nailed it. I'm not in love with the JavaScript ecosystem and how it works with my project in particular. So I would love to see some like more native solutions for Go for doing that. But like the idea of taking those on by myself is just, it's simply untenable. So I love that, you know, we are chatting and we're in the same space. I think we're starting to build a coalition. I've talked with some other folks in this space that might be interested in similar things. And I feel like if we could band together enough crazy people like us, we could almost build awesome solutions that could fit everybody's project and, and other projects as well. So I think that would be a great That'd goal. Be awesome. Yeah, yeah. 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 I remember you talking about kind of having your own kind of spelt and go. And I think that's a super interesting idea. Like if, if there's momentum on that, I would definitely love to contribute. Um, yeah. And that, I think that's a key, right? So it's like, you need momentum. I think the idea yeah. of just like going nuts on it, it just, Svelte wasn't written overnight. It's it's super complicated, especially yeah. the more I get into it and the more features I see that I can't live without anymore. It's just like, wow, this is super complicated to implement. Um, I, there is that, that rumor mill of, you know, Rich mentioned one time about potentially re rebuilding Svelte and Rust or something like that. That could potentially change things, but I, I'm not holding my breath for that. I don't think that's going to be on the roadmap for a long time for them. Um, but yeah, I think... Um... It's not just it's not just writing the compiler though too. It's like the ecosystem around it too. Like not even not, if you just even disregard like all the like Svelte date picker and all those things. Like sure. disregard that. You can build that yourself. It's mm -hmm. like the it's like the VS Code extensions. It's like all like sure. it's your auto complete language server. Like, yeah, yeah, the language server. It's like all those things that you're just like, oh man, this is a this is a heavy lift. Like, um, and so yeah. No, I, I've come to the same conclusion. It's, I really, you know, in this project, I actually didn't want to take on as many different things as I, I've I've started to already. And I just find myself going deeper and deeper down that hole. I really want to try to limit the problem set that I'm trying to solve here. I think it's going to just be too hard um, to, to manage it long term. Um, and what is your like, um, so I, I see plenty as kind of like a easier to use Hugo. Is that, is that a valid way of describing plenty or is there more is there more to it is there less is that more focused than that where where does where do you stand it that i mean that's pretty accurate so it i think on the one hand easier to use but i think there's a little bit more to it um so it's pretty accurate because hugo is a huge inspiration for what i'm trying to do i'm i'm not i didn't set out to build the next great javascript framework i i wanted to build a great static site generator um, and just JavaScript happens to be part of that equation because that's necessary to, to build the UI in the, the way that I want, right? So initially what I wanted to do, I think these two innovative projects that really sparked my interest was Hugo and Netlify CMS, which is Netlify's open source React based like editor, right? And I had done a couple of times for like some small projects, putting those together and trying to make them work. But there's a lot of rough edges to doing that. Like, um, like previews don't work out of the box because you're writing interfaces in React in one and you're writing in Go templates in the other. And those things don't really work well together. You're also often, you're like duplicating your content sources. So you're like building out field structures and things in Hugo. And then you're kind of remapping those things in Netlify CMS again. There's, there's all sorts of things that kind of make that experience not great. And I kept waiting for somebody to in, like find a more integrated approach for Jamstack stuff. And I just never saw it materializing. So I like waited for like three years for somebody to just do it, nobody did it. So I decided, I thought it was gonna be easier. I was like, I'll take, I'll take Svelte and I'll take this, I'll smash it together and boom. And yeah, there you it's go. Just, it's way harder than I thought it was. So I I definitely give those projects that have a lot more maturity, way more credit than I, I ever did before. Um, they're amazing. Yeah. Those people have put a tremendous amount of work into those. Um, so basically what I wanted to accomplish is a fast build. Um, so something built and go, and then a, a reactive front end. So you could do uh, live editing and updates and things like that. And if you put those things together in a meaningful way, what you could do is you could have what feels like a WordPress type experience where you're editing sites and it's saving and rebuilding. And it looks like a real-time feedback because your front end's updating automatically. Your builds are happening behind the scenes pretty fast and you're getting that somewhat real-time feedback. I um, mean, you can have all that without managing the server, right? So you don't have to you don't have to run a server. You basically deploy to GitHub, spin up a GitHub page or whatever, and you have a full uh, website. So that that's the target uh, that I'm, I'm aiming for. I think I'm getting a lot that's closer awesome. on the CMS side of things, but um, yeah. Yeah, that's super cool. Just even... Um... Having like so, I, I my one of my one of my many blogs was in in Hugo, mm -hmm. um, and the, like 
it's such a, it, it, I don't know, maybe it's just at this point, like at this point, it's such a mismatch to just kind of like add, it feels like you, you're, you've got your HTML, but then you're like, okay, now I need to add a button that does something and it's, or just like it's some interactivity, just even just a little bit. And you're just like, it feels at this point. So I don't know if it's gross or whatever, but just to kind of go into like your script tag and then like do a document dot query, query selector and just yeah. like kind of then update that thing by hand. Um, it's like, like the mental model of, I, I guess, React, but then Svelte kind of maybe refined it a bit, like of just, you know, like the interactivity is kind of built into like the system itself. And so it's yeah. one, it's like more or less one concept. Um, it just feels so much nicer. And so it's really, really hard for me to go and like use Go templates or like HTML at this point. It's like, it's it feels like going kind of back into like the stone age of it. Yeah. I, and I think I, I don't even know if I realized that initially when I was setting out doing this. So so for instance, um, I think Hugo's model of they're basically like most of it's unstructured uh, markdown. Right. And then they saw some of these things with like short codes and things like that to kind of in, intersperse structured aspects into unstructured content. I came out from the other approach. Like, I think we should structure this, you know, through JSON and then, you know, we can like build things out that way. Um, so that was like my fundamental approach. But then. I thought Svelte would be a, a nice, easy way to accomplish this. And I, I realized all the benefits of getting there now. Like I think Svelte templates are much easier to reason about than a Go template is. I think, you know, you're getting all those things like reactivity, like out of the box, scope CSS, all that stuff that I can't really live without anymore. And it's really that, you know, Rich and his team, they really figured out, I think, the way to build websites where you feel like you're doing HTML, CSS, and just like simple JavaScript, and you're getting these powerful experiences. So I think they really hit the nail on the head. That's why it's it's super fun to work in that ecosystem for sure yeah i mean it feels like um it feels like the way the web should like it should be like if you if yeah. you were to design html again yep. javascript again like that would be how i would do it um, exactly exactly it, it seems like that's what it's designed to be and i think i'm hoping you know people kind of grow up using this tool and they're going to think like that's what it is like they don't really need to know the shortcomings of all, like JavaScript and HTML and all that stuff. I mean, JavaScript couldn't import files until like recently, right? Like it, that, that's like a new concept. You just have to bundle everything and just kind of include it that way. So um, anyways, I think we're probably at that, you know, a, a good stopping point for tonight. I think this conversation was really productive and helpful for me to have clarity about what you're doing with Bud. Um, it's great. It's great to see you like from uh, a launch, what is a couple months ago now to well over 3,000 stars on GitHub. I think it's awesome. You're really like, taking off and people are responding to it. So it's so exciting to see, um, you know, the hard work that you put in there paying off. So, you know, congrats on all that. Thank you. Yeah, no, it was super fun. Uh, super fun chatting with you. And um, yeah, uh, thanks for, for thanks for reaching out too. Like um, I was, um, I wasn't even sure I was going to launch this thing. And so like, I remember we, we we, like we were thinking about jumping on a call earlier and I was like, I don't know. I don't know yet. Like, I'm not even sure that this is going to be anything that I end up oh, yeah. releasing. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy kind of, well, I made it to the finish line, but then I'm also, I'm more happy also that we can kind of actually connect and start talking about some of these concepts and stuff and, and hopefully, yeah, start bringing some people from either the JavaScript community or some, some gophers that want to make websites, um, to these, these, um, open source tools that we're building. Yeah. Great. All right. Thanks, Matt. I'm going to stop awesome. the recording. Cool.